So my clearest memories of primary school, um, and you can guess from the title this is what I'm going to talk about, my clearest memories are of sexual molestation, physical violence, and emotional cruelty. And for me, I always look back when I talk to my peers about my schooling, and I feel that what I experienced was closer to a Dickens novel than what most people do. It lit so far, obviously, inside me. I had a, a mantra, if only I was stronger, if only I was smarter. Um, and that kind of that mantra, although it's very unstable and, and it's very misguided, obviously what happened to me had nothing to do about being strong or by, about being smart. And it also has nothing about being happy, which is what I then dedicated my life to, is how do I help other children, other people get stronger and smarter so they can be happier? But what I find interesting is I'm luckily or wisely, I don't really know how it happened, I made my life about trying to achieve that for other people. And even though I had this sort of my misguided sense of the world of where I was trying to go, it put me on this amazing journey, which has been incredibly diverse. Um, I hope it's a unique perspective on the world. Um, it's taken me in all sorts of areas. So I'm a scientist, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, I've been an educator, um, and yes, I've even worked as, as a martial artist and an anti-terrorism trainer. Um, I've got to work with Stephen Hawking, which was a great privilege when I was at Cambridge. I have um, traveled the world and worked with all sorts of, of elite forces and tried to save lives there. But I've also traveled to Libya and um, seen firsthand uh, what that was like when Colonel Gaddafi was in power. So I've been into a number of places. And where that's led me now is... is I now run a company. I spend most of my days running a company where what we do is roll back the great mysteries of how the brain works. And we do it in a way that you wouldn't imagine. You'd think that was some sort of education business. And it's not. We work in digital marketing. What we do is we map and measure and respond to the cognitive processes that consumers uh, go through as they interact with brands. But interestingly, we get to work with as many as 26 million people in a day. And it's, it's kind of like a lab on a scale that's utterly unprecedented. And it gives me the chance to, it's kind of a dream come true, to look into the mysteries that kind of always perplexed me before I got into this area because they just didn't have enough information or data to solve them. And what I want to talk about today is what I call the elephant in the room with education. It's something that has been dear to my heart for, well, I mean, since the beginning, but this particular topic for at least 10 years. Um, and what I think is true is that there's a problem at the heart of education that we all know. We know that although it works for some, for many it crushes creativity and it destroys their confidence. And the reason for that, or one of the reasons I believe, is that about 30 years ago, essentially IQ was trying to tell us something. And we didn't want to listen, we didn't want to hear what it was trying to tell us because it seemed so unpalatable. And so, because we wanted lives to be better for our kids, we kind of ignored it. We didn't know, you might not know directly that's what you did, but that's what happened. And ever since then, we've been kind of making mistake after mistake in education. What I want to do today is to take you on a journey. I want to turn the world upside down. I want to talk, go straight into that uncomfortable place with what IQ is telling us. But then to show you that if you've got the courage to sit with that, to not try and deny it, but also to not accept it straight away, there's a journey through that, and interesting what I found is that journey goes back to what we all know is true, what we really want for our kids, and what we know is right for, if you like, for education. So I suppose the best place to start is, well, what is IQ? Um, it's obviously a very well-known thing. It is basically your general intelligence, your ability to solve problems. The average is 100. Most people range from 85 to 115, and there's the odd genius out there, one in a million, that's over 170. Um, so, what does IQ, why is it so important? Because it's the most predictive psychometric that's ever been discovered. It strongly predicts your peak income, for instance. It even predicts how likely you are to get divorced. Um, and most significantly, it is incredibly strongly correlated with your academic performance. So, what's the problem? The problem's really simple. IQ is basically inherited. How do we know that? Well, we knew that 30 years ago by studying what happens to twins, for instance, when they're adopted and brought up in different families. Um, obviously, if they're brought up in the same family, by comparing it. And by doing that, 
they created studies that could show which bits of your IQ came from your genes, which bits came from your family, from your parents putting input in, and which bit came from your school, essentially. Um, the most interesting of those, I find, is this one, which was a, a fantastic study that looked at a group of, uh, I think it was 250 children, roughly, through their lifetime. And what I find the most scary thing about this is if you look at the age of five as a parent, you're contributing hugely, maybe not the dominant thing, but you're almost as equally to, to their genes in terms of their IQ. But the message here, if you look at the chart, it sort of goes downwards. It's not just that as the child approaches 12, we're no longer inputting into their IQ. It's that our input has been completely wiped out. Now, the thing is with IQ is you don't need infinite amounts of it. In fact, by the time you reach 115 points, you can pretty much do anything you want. So IQ is really predictive between 85 and 115, where most of us sit. The problem is, yes, if we could raise IQ on average in education by 15 points, then lives would be transformed. But science is telling us you can only raise it by about four points, and reality is saying you're not even doing that. So what do I mean by reality? One of the things we do with schools is we rank them through SAT tests. They're a standardized academic test. They correlate very well with IQ. And we use that as somehow a way of benchmarking how good a school is. But what we're actually doing is benchmarking how smart the children were always destined to be in terms of IQ. When they entered the school and when they left the school, it's all the same. Now, if we take that away, if we just look at what's the difference between when the children enter the school and when they leave the school, we get a radically different picture. Between the bottom 2% of schools and the top 2% of schools, there is only a 6.5% swing in performance. Now, I don't know if that sounds significant, but it shouldn't. It should be 100%. It should be 200%. It should be massive, but it isn't. It's tiny. And that's practically saying something that is very difficult to hear. We're born with a certain amount of IQ or destined to have a certain amount of IQ. That determines a certain amount of factors. One of those is how well you're going to do at school. And there is nothing you can do from the day that you're born to the day you finish school to change that very much. Now, there'll always be exceptions to that rule, but I'm talking about the rule of the average. And yet we're using that to measure the performance of education. So that's what I mean by the dark place, the place that was unpalatable and we didn't want to go. Now, what's interesting to me as a neuroscientist is it's the last thing I would ever expect to be true of the human brain, that there would be this one parameter, this one thing that could measure your intelligence There's a sort of a single number. And I don't mean that from kind of my heart place that I look around me and there's such diversity in the world of people. That's true too. But the brain isn't really built in a way that you'd think that would work. So just as a starting point, I just wanted to bring across the power of the brain. So when I started in computers, the, B, the most powerful computer in the world is the Cray 2. It's shown up there at the moment. It was this massive thing. It would at least fill the stage probably more. It was so powerful, it had to have liquid nitrogen to cool its cores. And it's roughly the power of the iPhone 6 in your pocket today. Right? Now, if the iPhone 6 is a walking pace in terms of computers, then it would take you about a year to walk from here to Sydney. As your foot touched the pavement on your first step, your brain would go around the world 200,000 times. That's the difference between your iPhone 6 and what you're carrying in your head right now. It's absolutely vast. But even more interestingly, it's so diverse. It's nothing, it's the last thing you would expect from what I just told you. You're not one computer, you're 100 billion computers, and in fact, the intelligence that you are is encoded in 100 trillion connections between those computers. Are those connections built from your genes? No, they're not. They're built on a use it or lose it principle. In fact, your brain goes through the equivalent of a trillion years of human evolution over its lifetime. It's also a very... It's got lots of little localized clusters of, of, of things that, that work. So there's a little bit that deals with grammar, and there's a little bit that deals with recognizing faces. And there are hundreds of these centers across the brain. So when you look at it, you wouldn't think that there would be a single measure of intelligence. You'd think that there would be thousands, and they would be based on the environment, not on genetics. Now, by the work that I've done, and simply the, the, the number of people, we've been able to unlock this a little bit further, and then to understand other studies that have been there about uh, kind of other properties that people have. And in fact, what we have discovering, what we're working with, is there are actually three sorts of intelligence. One is abstraction intelligence, what we've been talking about, the ability to layer abstract ideas, IQ, problem solving. Then there's artisan, our ability to learn new things, whether that's chess, music, you know, all those skills that we can pick up. And then complexity intelligence, which is the last thing you expect 
to mean. If it's social, it's more like an emotional intelligence. And if it's kind of pointed inwards, it's an aesthetic intelligence. So like I said, not, not quite what you might expect. And although um, you can't study them exactly, we've worked out a huge amount about these and been able to relate them to various functions and, and studies around the brain. Now, the first thing I want to cover off is how on earth can IQ be singular? And the best way I can explain that to you is that although the IQ test, it's misunderstood, it's a very varied test. It's got verbal reasoning, numeracy skills, spatial awareness. It works using your conscious mind all the time. And by doing that, there's a feature. It's very hard to define consciousness, but there's a feature you can define quite easily. And that can be seen in these pictures. If you look at the pictures, you can either see... Um, one version or the other, your mind can flip between the two, but seeing both at the same time is pretty much impossible. Your conscious brain brings the world into a single scene. It's the most amazing thing our brain does. It's done by billions of connections, bringing your whole neocortex, your upper brain, into synchrony in about half a second. And IQ has to do with the performance of that system, which is why it's a single measure. Now let's go to something else, artisan intelligence. The clearest bit of information I give you about that is when scientists studied what I call skill athletes, chess players, musicians, and they looked at the difference between the world's best and the professionals and sort of the people in the middle, they found one consistent thing that linked them together, and that was the number of hours of practice. The people at the top, about 20,000. The people who are just kind of on the professional ladder, 5,000, everyone else in between. And what's interesting is we've gone from having something that's completely almost inherited to something that's completely based on our behavior and choices. Um, now, the next thing, complexity intelligence, is very hard to study, whether that's aesthetic or, or social or emotional, but what we have discovered by studying a number of these kind of thousands of factors that make it up is it is related to your personality development. And what I'm showing on the screen is, is called the big five. It's your fundamental kind of set of traits in personality. And what you should be able to see here is really interesting that, yes, you do inherit it to an extent, but the pivotal part of this that, you, that isn't inherited comes from your school life. So what does that mean for education? What should we be doing? And I just want to propose something that isn't really groundbreaking, that we should be firstly focusing on what we can actually change, what we can actually empower people to do, and not on a very narrow perspective of something that's hard to change or, or, or we can make a little difference in. So if we look at education through that principle, we see two things will actually shine out, the top two things on that list. The first is to focus on artisan intelligence. What does that mean? It means understanding that everybody's got a different brain, that they're actually on a creative journey from you know, the moment they're kind of they're born all the way through their lives, working out what matters to them, how they work, and how they can use themselves to get what matters to them. And a lot of people think, oh, if you're talking about artisan intelligence, you're talking about just you know, a bit of design technology and will you be an apprentice and are you going to go into carpentry? But I'm not. I mean, music and martial arts are more pure. But actually, what we're talking about is inspiring kids to practice it could be BMX riding, it could be tiddlywinks, it really couldn't matter less because what they're doing is discovering how they work, how to get themselves to be better at something. Um, and that's immensely important. That's something that 100% that we can change. And the second factor, which I think is utterly critical, is that schools play this pivotal role in terms of our personality development. And there is the science there to measure whether they're doing a good job. Now, personality is very individual. I'm not suggesting we're all trying to conform people like SAT tests to one thing. But think about personality a different way. If you've been nourished, you've had good, loving experiences, your personality is kind of well-rounded and smooth and it's comfortable with itself. And if you haven't, it's jagged and kind of a little offset and uncomfortable. It's not about the sort of general space it, it fills. It's about its sort of shape and quality. But we can measure that. Can you imagine a school system where we ranked schools by measuring the personality development of the children within them and how well they were supporting each teacher and each classroom, each year, each school was doing that. It would be a radically different process. Right at the bottom, you'll see I've put abstract intelligence because that's about discovering if you've got those abilities and then taking them further. But it's not a place of this is central. I think what we need to do is really ask the question, what matters? And I think we do know what matters. The problem is, by making everything about SAT scores, by making it all about peak incomes or a limited amount of professional development, we focus on IQ, and we disenfranchise a lot of kids by doing it. But if we ask ourselves what we want for our kids, I've got five of them. I couldn't give a stuff how much they earn in their lives, and I don't care if they turn into doctors or lawyers. But what I care about is, are they happy? 
Are they, uh, can, do they contribute to the world around them? Can they form great relationships? And in fact, economically, I haven't got time to go into it here, there's a great, you know, there's a lot of evidence there that actually what you're looking at with educational performance isn't a full predictor of that. So really what I wanted to say was, by looking at that idea of IQ and by going through it, we come to a completely different place with, it, with education. And by going to somewhere dark and having the courage to face it, you come through to something, uh, kind of a different vision. And what I hope now is, here we have teachers with what they're trying to achieve and the skills that they have, and actually they, they can do this job. We have governments that need to measure it, and they've been at war for 20, 30 years with kids in the middle. And we actually have the technology to overcome that war and to end that fight. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.